Hello, Tom Levecki here with the latest edition of the Armchair MBA. I tried to upload this yesterday, and for some reason, didn't record the screen. So unfortunately, I had to do it again. But I'm happy to do it, as today we're going to be discussing when Salvatore Rina, the boss of all bosses, allegedly was going to take John Gotti out. Uh, check out This Day in the Mob. It's a great podcast. I'm going to put a link below. Um, anniversary, I think, eight years of the the death of Black Jack Toko. He talks about that every day. John posts. His name is John. Great guy. He posts um, a new story every day on This Day in the Mob. Check it out. There's a link below. So we'll get started. So this is uh, an Italian channel, Demasi. I some of the uh, across it, and uh, it's pretty interesting how they tell the Italian kind of side of things. Uh, and again, the question is: Did Tutorina, Salvatore Irina, um, want to kill John Gotti Jr., the boss of all bosses, aka they call him the King of New York, which he definitely was? Sono di me, Andrea, e vi do il benvenuto nel mio canale YouTube. Nel video di oggi vi voglio raccontare una storia che non tutti voi conoscete. All right, so today uh, he's explaining to talk a little bit about how Rina wanted to eliminate John Gotti. Vi voglio raccontare di quando Salvatore Irina, il capo dei capi di Cosa Nostra, all right, so for those who may not know, I know 99% of people do in the mob space. Totorina was the head of the Colionese family, um, and he took over pretty much the entire Cosa Nostra in Sicily from the 80s, probably to about the mid 90s. Um, draw that way, literally killed over 300 people, um, took out heads of families, uh, took out actual families. Tommaso Buscetta's family, who was a Pentiti, an informant. Um, totally gutted his family, which was a shame. The guy was a monster and literally uh, fought his way to the top of the Cosa Nostra. Uh, in Sicily. The più potenti boss della mafia americana. Ormai Salvatore di Ina non si accontentava più di dettare legge in Sicilia. All right, so the, fir the first part of it is that um, because the Arena took over everything in Sicily, literally, um, he started to kind of get the itch. He's like, you know what? I want to kind of show and flex a little bit in the U.S. And I'll get to um, my theory and his theory uh, why in a second. Dimostrare anche oltre oceano che lui era il più forte di tutti. Allora, ragazzi, come al solito, guardiamo prima la sigla e poi vi racconto perché Salvatore Dina voleva la morte di John Gott. All right. So as he does his intro, um, to set this up as he was kind of mowing down his competition left and right then he started to set ahead his eyes on the us and again we'll go to that so why in a second story di quando salvatore di il capo di capi di cosa nostra voleva uccidere il re della mafia americana john gotti yeah, he called him the king of the mafia in new york which again which is probably true for john gotti as we know john gotti took over in 1985 uh or last year early 86 and ruled on the streets i think what 1991 so I had a five-year run. So this was kind of happening concurrently with what was going on in Sicily. That's what makes it interesting. So for those people that kind of like the Sicilian Cosa Nostra stuff and the stuff that like the American stuff, like many of us do, the fact that the stuff is going on and almost intersected and some parts did intersect, it's really interesting. The first thing, let's look at John Gotti and then we'll tell you why he wanted to die. John Gotti nacque il 27 ottobre del 1940 nel Bronx a New York. As you know, John Gotti was born in the Bronx, October 27th, 1940, uh, again in the Bronx. La famiglia era originaria di San Giuseppe Vesuviano. So this is interesting. I never knew what, where his family was from in Italy. Evidently, they originate from San Giuseppe Vesuviano. Um, that is a small town uh, in the Napoli region. Probably about two hours from Napoli. I was checking to see where it is from, from Malata, where we're from. Uh, probably about an hour, hour and a half. So we're not really Paisani per se, but uh, San Giuseppe Vesuviano is in Napoli province. Che è un piccolo comune in provincia di Napoli. Quando aveva 12 anni, la sua famiglia si trasferì. And I guess that's when they moved to, as they say in Italian, Brooklyn. Uh, they had an extra symbol in there. Uh, uh, um, so um around 12 years old um syllable sorry brooklyn an extra syllable in there um and that's when they moved to brooklyn according to this 
Lui, John Gotti, abbandonò la scuola e insieme ai fratelli Peter e Richard entrò a far parte di una delle gang del posto. So, evidently, I guess uh, John Gotti um, quit school along with his brother Peter and Richard, um, early teens, uh, to join, I guess, a gang. And um, I guess they were kind of a farm team for the Cosa Nostra, according to this. La gang commetteva piccoli furti. In seguito, John Gotti entrò a far parte della famiglia mafiosa dei Gambini, che era una delle cinque più potenti famiglie mafiose di New York. Yeah, at the time, and we could agree, especially with Carlo Gambino being around, probably the most important family, the most, um, probably the strongest family of the five at the time, along with the Genovese. Il capo della famiglia era Carlo Gambino. E per conto della famiglia dei Gambino, John Gotti continuò a commettere dei furti. All right, so this is important. So we look at Carlo Gambino, and he was a, a, allegedly a made man from the other side when he came over. Obviously, when he came over here, he headed up the Gambino family. Um, he had relations um, with the Inzarello family. Uh, the Inzarello, they um, held from Palermo. The Spatola family had connections with allegedly, and a few other prominent Palermitani families, um, and that was kind of his cause of his rise to power. He kind of came over from mafia royalty, came over here, rose through the ranks, old school mafioso, took over, and at that point, up into the seventies, had a strong relationship directly with the Sicilian mafia. Fino a quando non venne arrestato nel 1968. And I think you guys know the story. In 1968, he was arrested and did three years. E venne e condannato a tre anni di carcere. Uscito dal carcere, iniziò la carriera della famiglia dei Gambini. All right, and that's when obviously he got out and then started to uh, kind of carry the Gambino flag. I believe he was made. Um, I don't know what was he made. Was it made in 75? I think it was 75. Venne nominato capo regime e si legò al boss Agnello della Croce, che era il braccio destro di Carlo Gambino. In questo periodo. All right, so they take a little bit of a different twist on the Castellano stuff. He said that the, the mob was really big in the heroin in the 70s. Um, so when Carlo Gambino died, he had um, he had Paul Castellano take over. His right hand, Carlo, uh, Neil De La Croce, got pushed aside, right? So very Sicilian, had my brother in law take over, a family thing, that kind of stuff, right? Let me pause a second. Uh, and evidently, the part of the reason Neil obviously supported it, the boss is the boss is the boss. Um, however, according to this particular journalist or podcaster or YouTuber, if you want to call him, he said the part of the reason the rift not just was because of change of control, it's just that uh, they literally said no more drug dealing, which caused an issue with Gotti and the ranks. I don't buy that that was the main reason, um, but that was just what they offer. Um, so Totorina developed a relationship directly with Castellano, and um, I kind of figured that, but he had a direct relationship with Castellano. He obviously had a relationship with John Gambino, Totorina. And then on top of it, what's interesting is Totorina did not have any relatives here in the U.S., very common for a mafioso to have a relationship or, or um, relatives here in the U.S., and vice versa, obviously. And it makes it a little easier, makes you a little more powerful, has you different relationships. If you have to go on the, the run, the land, that kind of stuff. So Totorina, essentially, his guy in the U.S. was um, Constantino Paul Castellano, who was Sicilian himself, uh, a Sicilian heritage. And that was essentially his guy. Che facevano parte della mafia, oltre oceano. E per questo motivo, avere un suo amico. So, you know, not just not just a uh, matter of having a relationship with Castellano. Um, you now have a guy who's ahead of the five families, right? So now you're the most powerful mafiosi, uh, mafioso in, in all of Cosa Nostra, all Sicily. Then you add in, you got the Gambino guy in the hook in the U.S. Obviously, he had Camorra relationships and Dragada, and Dragada relationships. So pretty much he was power hungry. And in terms of power, I'd put him up there with Pablo Escobar. I might get some pushback on that. The guy killed two federal magistrates, killed over 300 people. So the guy was a maniac, uh, but he also was a very important 
mob officer as well. So his goal was to, and motive was to, to keep the relationship with Paul Castellano going because that was his guy in New York. Important in America, no could ever find out, okay? Number one, his prestige in Cosa Nostra. And for over there too, although obviously it didn't hurt to have Sicilian relationships when you're here um, with Cosa Nostra, it didn't hurt to have pretty high level, high ranking relationships uh, in the United States. Remember, Cosa Nostra at that point. Um, the Gambino family alone in the mid '80s was making five hundred million dollars a year in aggregate. Um, it was it was said that if it was listed as a company, they would be in the Fortune 500. Paul Castellano, come divenne capo della famiglia, bandì la droga dagli affari della famiglia. Yeah, so his edict was uh, to ban drugs right away. Uh, Paul Castellano. E questa sua decisione non la prese bene Agnello della Croce. Like I said, his spin is Neil De Croce was unhappy, not only not getting the top spot, but with that official ban. E con la droga faceva fare d'oro. La famiglia si divise in due e John Gotti si schierò. And, and we know there was a rift in the family between um, Neil's kind of faction and then obviously the people that were loyal to Carlo Gambino and then Castellano. So it was a point where John Gotti obviously um, waited for a Neil De La Croce to die, and then once he passed, then he made a move um, on Gotti. Yep. But obviously, in Sicily, as I learned that from a predecessor, talked about stand on ceremony, um, Totorina stand on ceremony. So the fact that um, let me move this back, the fact that he killed the boss without commission and approval um, had Sicily pretty pissed off as well. Salvatore Dina prese il comando di Cosa Nostra. All right, so when he started taking over and and he just literally just cleaned house. E stava in uh, totally in Sicily. And tutti i suoi passati. Prima tocca Stefano Bondante. All right, so one critical kill initially was Stefano Bondante, um, was head of the Mendemente, I believe, and it was in Palermo. And this was a very, very big hit at the time, um, taking out another boss and started to set the stage and started to tip um, the war in favor of the Corleonese. E poi a Salvatore Inzerini. All right, so this is really important as well to this story and overall US and uh, Sicilian Cosa Nostra. Um, then he killed Salvatore Inzerello. The reason why that was important was he was a head boss um, in Palermo. And again, Italy operates a lot differently. Um, if you're a rival, they don't just kill you. Um, they'll kill your family, whether they're in the life or not, it doesn't matter. Um, and that's one of the tenants that they always kind of operated by. And uh, killing Anzarello was a big deal, just like Bontante. So watch what happened next. Inzerillo erano imbarentati proprio con la famiglia dei gambini. E per questo molti di loro scapparono in America. All right. So then um, they just had a jet. They were losing. They were getting crushed. So it's kind of either kind of stay in Sicily or die. So those people, those mafiosos, went over to America. And they are known as Yi Scarpati, which means the runaways. Now, they were brought into the fold of the Gambino family. Why is that? As we discussed earlier, Carlo Gambino had relations with the Inzarellos, familiar relations, obviously, but also mafia relations. John Gambino, mafia relations with the Inzarello so, uh, clan. So when they came over here, they it made sense for them to fold into the Gambino family. Paul Castellano e Salvatore Dina fecero un accordo. All right, so that's where it's interesting is, and, and I might debate this one a little bit. He's saying that Salvatore Dina and, um, and Paul Castellano had a deal. He goes, hey, listen, these guys are on our side now, meaning in, in America. They're not going to come back. They promise not to come back. Please do not kill them. Um, in exchange, it can live harmoniously. We'll get them out of your hair. Um, we'll keep them under the protection of the Gambino family here. If they sit back foot on your, your territory, kill them. But we'll keep them here. What I personally think, I think John Gambino brokered that deal. And then um, um, Paul Castellano rubber stamped it. That's just my opinion. But either way, that... Uh, accord or that uh, deal was made. Totorina avrebbe risparmiato gli inzerillo che si erano rifugiati in America in cambio. In America i gambino dovevano eliminare Pietro e Antonino. In All right, so Rina said fine, 
but I have two more that I need from you. Uh, Pietro Inzadella, who was killed um, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, and Ant Antonino Inzadella, who was actually found in a trunk in New Jersey. So evidently, um, as a favor and out of respect for, for Todorina, those two guys were eliminated. There's kind of uh, mobologists wa watching this. Drop your comments below. There's some debate as to why Antonino was killed. Allegedly, one was because he was made on both sides. There's a few different kind of stories here or there. But this one seems pretty valid that um, they were eliminated uh, because Totorina said, hey, you know what? You guys want to go to America. That's fine. That's fine. Um, however, um, I need these two guys taken care of. And Paul Castellano clearly obliged, which I believe fortified the relationship between the two Borgatas. <laughs> And uh, they were specifically the brother and the uncle of Salvatore, uh, Salvatore and Zarella, who I explained earlier, was a prominent mob boss who was murdered by the Corleonese. They call it the, 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 what is it, the white, the white wolf, the white, the white, uh, white shotgun. And that's one of the ways that um, they kill them. It's the way the Sicilians like to kill. Um, that's how Antonino was killed. Actually, near, I believe, Cherry Hill. And I believe he gave the order for the Cherry Hill Gambino crew to handle it. Um, they were out of 18th Ave at the time, but they also lived in Cherry Hill. And again, either way, um, kind of the boss is the boss. Castellano would either have to approve it or broker the deal and then approve it. Either way, it did require his stamp no matter what. All right, so obviously when, when we know this already, when John got, uh, when Anil de la Croce died, that gave the opening for uh, John Guy to act. Con la morte di Agnello della Croce, John Gotti ha una sorta di via libera e quindi può eliminare Paul Castellano. Infatti non c'era più nessuno che poteva fermarlo. Il 14 dicembre del 1985, Paul Castellano venne ucciso insieme al suo autista, Tommy Bigliotti, mentre si trovava davanti a un ristorante della quarantesima strada di Manà. John Gotti eliminò Paul Castellano senza so, permesso di... The castle on a hit and um again did it without the permission um of the commission which as we know was a cavalier move um which resulted in the bombing in uh the chin getting bombed i always kind of wondered chin probably did it autonomously but i do kind of wonder if this is saying ever involved with that do not buy solar panels if you live in one of these 11 states of america it's the worst decision you can so when you do these live, live you run into commercials e soprattutto con una idea di meno negli ultimi come reagì a questo salvatore di china ce lo racconta il collaboratore di giustizia rosario naimo okay so introduce rosario naimo naimo so he's an interesting guy and love the mobologist to drop some some background below but my research shows that he went from sicily directly to uh detroit and his role was to be kind of the number one guy representing the sicilian mafioso the sicilian mafia specifically the coilian essay in the u.s um i want to do a um a story about this i believe that there's factions to this day um that are sicilian report into sicily that are sicilian mafiosi that uh, operate autonomously from the cosa nostra here in the u.s but with that being said uh rosario initially moved to Detroit. He later moved to, I believe, New York and then New Jersey. And then what's interesting is, and we'll get to in this, I'll talk about it a little later, he got made into one of the American families. It was not the Gambinos, and we'll talk a little bit uh, why in a second. Rosario Naimo, when he was part of Cosa Nostra, he was an important intermediary. So his role was when Tutorina sent him to the U.S. Uh, you got to remember at the time, Detroit was powerful at the time. There was other Borgatas um, with Sicilians especially Detroit and other areas. So it wasn't just like just New York. So his role was not only to be the intermediary for Cosa Nostra in um, the US and Sicily, 
uh, I mean, New York and Sicily, but all of U.S. and Sicily. And his role was kind of be uh, uh, was to be the go between. Um, interesting enough is he asked Totorina, I uh, said, "Hey, listen, you know, I'm here for a while. I'm, you know, it's alleged. I'm here for a while. I'd like to get my stripe here in the U.S. Um, back then, it was a big deal. I would like to be a man of honor on this side of the pond. And initially, um, Rina said, "No, no, no, you're too important to us. Um, we want you to stay with us." And Totorina allegedly described this guy as having more powerful, more power than the president. This guy was a really powerful mafioso. Uh, it was out of name of. Ah, la mafia americana e quella siciliana. Ascoltiamo. Si ricorda anche. Che... Okay, so this is his um, interview. So he turned Pentiti, or a collaborator of justice, or as some call it, rat, um, at around, I believe, 2010. And then this is one of his interviews where he unearthed that Totorina was planning to kill John Gotti. E una volta Rina le disse di eh, uccidere John Gotti. Sì, sì, sì. Okay, so he's asking about it, and he keeps confirming that this case. Guy's not typical Sicilian, not a man of many words, as you can tell, but you can hear. So you me ricordo? Sì, sì. Sì, come me ricordo. E che cosa le disse di dire, se le avessero chiesto, diciamo, di, eh, di questo? Yeah, so the, 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 the prosecutor, journalist, and he's asking him, you know, for his opinion, why. And this all came from, I believe, this, these interviews. No, no, questo in particolare. Perché io gli disse, io io gli ho risposto, il suo dottore, ma se ammazziamo a Gianni Cotte a New York è una guerra. Okay, so he responded that if we killed John Gotti in New York, and drop, drop your comments below, what do you think would have happened if Adina did do it? Um, his concern, it would have created a war below. You have to remember, at the time, there was stronger links between Sicily and, and U.S., um, a group like the Inzarello clan has family in Sicily, could easily fire back at Totorina and his crew, uh, maybe disrupt the, uh, the heroin pipeline, maybe buy it from other places, uh, other Sicilian families in Cosa Nostra, maybe even from other Italians. Um, so he, he had a concern that if Gotti gets taken out, um, that it would have created a big war between the two rivals. <laughs> arrabbiato con questo Gianni Gotti perché si era sentito il fatto che aveva ammazzato Paul Castellano. Yeah, and for that reason he just um, wanted to get rid of Gotti because um, he killed Castellano, number one and number two without permission. E Paul Castellano lui diciamo noi ci teneva di più perché nel 70 no, no, nell'81 yeah, so it's 81, he wouldn't have went to America again. Rosario initially went to um, Detroit. And now I can share um, that when he came to New York, he got hooked up with the Lucchese family. <clears throat> the reason why this is interesting, for many reasons, I want to unpack this for a second. Number one, the Lucchese family never really had a strong zip faction or strong zip tie. So I find that first part interesting. Number two, well, why did, he was actually related to the Inzarellas, not Naimo. Even though he was aligned with Colinese, he had some blood, tie, uh, um, some blood ties to the Inzarella bloodline. Um, however, he decided not to go with the Gambinos for the simple fact that um, if he did, it almost looks like, and this is my opinion, um, it almost looks like he's partnering or siding with the Escarpati, which is Gambinos, many of them and would be an insult to those in Sicily, and then he would wind up dead. Um, so he didn't want to get a stripe in the U.S. He did it later after Totorina got captured. I think at that point it wasn't a big deal. Uh, Ber uh, Bernardo Provenzano took over. Um, he had a little diff different philosophy than Totorina. Totorina pretty much killed everybody, even though Bernardo Provenzano was known as a tractor, which he mowed everybody down. Totorina was a mad hatter. So with that said, is he got made into Lucchese family, Rosario Naimo, and I believe he lived here in New Jersey, not too far from me, in Colonia, New Jersey, according to my research. And he turned in 2010. 
Yeah, and, and technically, um, and I, again, I always believe it's John Gambino, but technically, John Gotti would have been the link to Sicily after Paul Castellano passed because that was Castellano's role. He had relationships with Sicily. Um, if you hear Sammy, one of his podcasts, talked about um, they were worried about John Gambino and his crew taking um, kind of some uh, retribution. Uh, I believe they were also related. Uh, at least through marriage, Castellano and the Gambinos uh, of Cherry Hill. And um, the Cherry Hill Gambinos like, hey, we're just here to make money. We're good. Um, but if it were to happen, it probably would have surfaced uh, through that crew. They had the means. They had the manpower. They had the money. They had the respect. But they decided to kind of stay in their own lane, which I have a certain amount of respect for because they just didn't get involved with a lot of the politics. But certainly um, – when Sa- allegedly when Sammy went to go see them, I believe there there was probably the only crew they were worried about. Yeah, so he's just kind of going on and on about um they kind of thought John Gotti was like a little crazy for doing what he's doing. Um, and um, again, just wanted to do the, uh, put the order out to um, have him taken out. Again, in short, um, he did not support the killing of, uh, of taking out Gotti. Um, however, something Tuttorino wanted to do. Um, I think other things just simply got in the way. He was fighting a war um, at the time in Sicily. So that kind of really didn't, you know, to the early 90s, still was kind of battling the other mob families. And then early 90s, he took his um, kind of his proverbial shotgun towards the state, killing Falcone, Borsellino, some bombings in mainland. Italy, which killed um, civilians, which was crazy. And they did that to try to draw the eye away from Sicily over to the mainland. And also Giuliani. Giuliani was also on the Sicilian Mafia uh, radar screen. The commission in New York had enough power at the time to vote on whether or not the Sicilian Mafia can do that in the U.S. And according to Greg Scarpa, the vote was three to two. Uh, Bonanno said no. Uh, Lucchese said no. Um and Genovese said no, but according to reports, Gotti and Persico said yes. So three to two, and they decided not to move uh, on killing Giuliani. It had to be with commission blessing, but it would have been carried out by the Sicilian Mafia. So again, they were looking for Giuliani, number one, and then later on, possibly John Gotti. Uh... Eh, Naimo, cioè per non lasciare il discorso in sospeso, in sostanza poi questo attentato a John Gotti fu fatto o no? No, no. No, no. 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 Prego, no. Senta, no. Per, per ricordo, le, le leggo una cosa che eh, ha dichiarato nel verbale il 23 luglio del 2020. Yeah, this was uh, later on Earth again in July of 2020. Um, and... Um, that's kind of how it came out. I don't I don't know why this didn't get picked up more. I don't know if uh, a lot of the US media is familiar with his audio. Um, I don't know if this is considered enough of a trusted source. Um, I did some research on my end. I always felt that this was plausible. I always felt that um, this was true. Um, I was always surprised why the same mafia just kind of said, okay, you know what, we lost a representative. Um, you know, but their connections weren't deep enough operation in a sense where um, they didn't lose any money from it, if anything. Um, I think when, and, and, and there are multiple reports that John Gambino actually went to Sicily to meet with Totorina. Um, in my opinion, um, I think that they did business. Who did the Gambinos get it from? We could push and pull. But if they took over the pipeline in Sicily and the biggest importers here were the Gambinos outside of the pizza connection, I think it was one of those deals where Totorino wanted to keep the Gambinos happy because they were customers and those were the one buttering his bread. But in exchange, he couldn't lose face. That's why Iscarpati had to go and why they had to kill the two Inzarello uncle and brother here in the U.S.
eh, mi disse di uccidere John Gotti parla di Rina chiaramente, di non dirlo a nessuno, mi disse, virgolette, negalo pure con me, anzi domandami chi è stato. Lo conferma questo? Sì, 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 questo è il Sì, Yeah, so he essentially confirms um, that it was a case, um, and there you have it, you can give your opinion um, as, as if it was true or not true, But according to this audio, he said that um, Totorino was to take out John Gotti. I'll leave it up to you. A, drop your comments below if you believe that um, it was a case. And number two, feel free to share and surmise what do you think of happened if that did happen. Um, if there was a war, who would win it and how it would shake out. Thank you for watching the Armchair NBA. Uh, check out the merch store. I'll put a link below. Also check out the podcast This Day in the Mob. Have a good one, guys.